Okay, so first we have on, on his way up here now, uh, Jason Gomes, he's an agronomist and a CCA uh, with Northern uh, Iowa Agronomy Partners. Yeah. Uh, did I get something scrambled? Right? North Iowa. Yeah. North Iowa. Okay. Um, so any of y'all, just stop me if you have any questions. Um, it always helps people ask questions and have interesting insights or things they want to know in specific. Um, I am a little sleep deprived, um, so I apologize if I get a little bit incoherent. We just got a new puppy like 10 days ago, and we also have a three-year-old, so has anybody ever done that? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Um, so my name is Jason Gomes, I'm a certified crop advisor, independent agronomist. I work mostly in northeast Iowa, but we do technical service stuff and soil sampling basically all over the state. So um, we've worked in the past a lot with um, NRCS doing technical service provider work and then, um, like I said, basically agronomy service is not too dissimilar probably from what a lot of you guys do. Either you're doing it or you're contracting it out to somebody else. Um, lots of soil sampling, nutrient management, basically advising growers on how much fertilizer to apply is a big thing. I mean, how many of you, show of hands, are working or selling fertilizer? So, how often does a grower come in and you tell him what you want, or excuse me, you tell him what you want to do, he says, no, I think I know better than you. How often does that happen? In my experience, 50, 70% of those growers are looking to you guys for advice. And they're gonna to listen to whatever you say. So don't be ripping them off, for one. <laughs> but for two, when Mike talks about the culture of conservation, the massive effort that it takes to meet the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy goals, it's gonna start with people in this room. If you guys make a priority this coming year, it'll happen, and if you make it a priority, it'll happen. We'll reach these goals in five years. Um, so I'm gonna talk, uh, Mike asked me to talk about basic conservation assessments, resource concerns, excess nutrients, soil loss, just all that stuff, um, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. We we'll probably touch on that a little bit. Uh, probably not so much on the retail, retail side, but again, to solve some of these issues, we're gonna have. So this is a picture from Louisiana State University. Um, you see this is kind of a front row seat to what's called the Gulf hypoxic zone, right? Um, Can they turn lights on? It's clear. Lights, anybody? Okay. So, this is the issue that the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy intends to solve. Um, and I think, as Mike was pointing out, it's going to get solved, whether we do it voluntarily or whether five years from now somebody says, okay, you can't apply uh, more than 150 pounds of nitrogen, you can't plant corn in more than three out of five years. I mean, pick a thing. But it's going to happen one way or another. There are ways to do it sustainably by choice, or there are ways to do it where somebody's just gonna tell you what you do. Um, so conservation basics, soil erosion is a big thing and it's a big avenue to losses of phosphorus in our waterways. Um, basic assessment tools would be Russell 2. How many of you guys work as TSPs? Show of hands, I know you do. <laughs> how many of you guys know how much soil you're losing from your farms? from your client's farm. <coughs> and how much is sustainable, right? Like, soils in Iowa, it's like being born rich, you know? We don't think about how much soil we've lost over the last 100 years because we had so much of it to begin with. But can we do it another 100 years or 200? I mean, 
this farm ground is the biggest asset that your clients have, you know, in their business portfolio. So they need to protect it. So basic soil of soil loss assessments. Russell two is a big one. It's used by the University or the, the NRCS. It's used by TSPs. It's a program that if you do it right, it's going to give you apples to apples comparisons across different tillage systems. Um, I'm not suggesting everybody needs to go out and become a TSP. Go to the go to the NRCS. Ask them to run one of these. Have your clients go find out how much soil they're losing. Because um, some of them it's going to surprise them. Some of them literally don't know. So <coughs> this is kind of a um, basic soil loss um, Russell II erosion profile record. If you look down there in the left hand, middle, lower left, the T value, five tons per acre. That's how much you're allowed to lose in the soil and still be within HEL compliance. Um, but if it's not something we measure regularly, what kind of context do we have to advise our clients on, right? For all you guys might know, most of our soils are, we're losing two tons an acre, right? Where does no-till come in? You know, what about your guys who are full chisel? What's their soil loss? If they're twice what the watershed average is or twice what the county average is, do something about it. Have them do something about it. Um, so your Russell 2 is gonna look at sheet and rill erosion. Sheet and rill erosion is basically the erosion you can't see. If you can see it in the field, it's gonna be a gully or a classic gully. Um, <coughs> But sheet or real erosion is hard to see, like I said, but it's real. I, I had an instance this spring where we do some crop scouting up by Nashua, far northern Iowa, Floyd County, Mitchell County. If any of you are from up there, we got pounded by some spring rains, just pounded. Um, had a small area in a field that the planter turned off, basically it's a blank spot, you know, what, 45 feet wide by, you know, 50 foot. After that pounding rain, and we're talking probably five to eight inches, I mean, you could see, and it's probably on a sea slope, you can see displacement of soil of approximately, you know, half an inch or something moved within that, say, 45 foot span. So that's an extreme, exam extreme example. You probably won't see that in a field very often. Um, but those are tons per acre when you look at that occurring across the state, across the whole field. So get to know these numbers. Um, ask for soil loss calculations. Have your clients go into the NRCS or call a TSP. I mean, for somebody to do this for you, NRCS staff are very familiar with it. I mean, it's literally a five, 10 minute process. <clears throat> Other elements that, that the uh, soil loss, uh, the rest of two, um, looks at would be the soil conditioning index, which is a matter, which is a factor of um, how, let's see how should I put this, um, whether your tillage and cropping system are building or losing organic matter. So the high numbers are better. This one, so this Russell 2 erosion calculation is actually from a no-till cover crop guy. So like a 0.84 is quite high. It's not uncommon to see them above one in some of these conservation tillage systems. But it's also, you know, when you know you're really doing a bad job is when you have a negative number. <laughs> but that happens. How many of your clients know if they have a negative <coughs> number? I'm guessing some of them do. I have clients who do. Um, you know, part of my job is, yes, there's the conservation element. But people also pay me to help them grow corn. When we help them grow corn, how often are we talking about conservation? It's easy to forget about it, right? Bring it up. Make sure that they know that they need to think about it. And then the stir value would be a soil tillage intensity, intensity rating, basically looking at the speed depth uh, of tillage equipment. Um, your no-till systems are going to be quite low. Um, your conventional tillage systems sometimes will be 50 plus. We do a lot of conservation planning in the middle cedar. Um, you know, and you, when you think about what we measure as CCAs or consultants, 
you all know what the yields were like in your county. You know what yields a lot of your growers had. Do you know what, you, what soil loss they had? I mean, do you know what their nitrogen use efficiency is? If we're not measuring that stuff, you're not going to be able to track it. You're not going to have any context to understand what's happening from one year to the next. So, one thing, Russell 2 soil loss calculations, measure it. Get an idea of what people are doing. I'm not saying do it on every field. You know, I have some of your clients do it on one. Anyway, point being, we do a lot of conservation outreach and stuff in the middle cedar. Um, so one of the things we also offer is we look at ISU's daily erosion project. If you haven't looked at that, go look it up. It's kind of cool. It will tell you on a sub watershed, small watershed level, HUD 12 watersheds, what the average soil loss is across that whole watershed. Now, remember we talked about Russell 2, what's tolerable soil loss, 5T. If you look at this Hinkle Creek watershed, which can't guarantee where it is, but I'm guessing it's in Benton County, Benton County probably somewhere south, it's a little bit hilly. Um, they're showing soil loss above T in a lot of years, five, 10 tons. Um, we look at historic rainfall. This is why we need to manage soil loss better. This is from the Vinton stations, from the Iowa Environmental Mesonet. 1942 to 2017, we're picking up another five, 10 inches of rainfall per year. I mean, how many, how many inches of rain did we get last, last year? Anybody? Yes? How much? Too damn much. Yeah, I think it was like, what, 49 inches? Am I wrong on that? Yeah. That's where you're going to get events like that client I was telling you about up in Floyd County. The soil loss and displacement is massive, okay? If we're getting that much rain, it's not only, not only do we have a problem that we're not solving, it's about to get 10 times worse. So think about that. Think about the soil loss. Think about the rainfall. Think about... What kind of climate are we looking at 10 years from now? It doesn't matter why it's happening, whether you believe in climate change or not. Frankly, I never bring up that stuff with clients because it's, it's too political. It doesn't really, but this is the reality. What we think about doesn't matter. Clients will adjust to this because they see it all the time. And then we do um, some different systems comparisons for different soil erosion. Um, Scenarios. So this is a guy again, hilly country, probably southern Benton County. He's doing. He's probably farming some ground that was C and D slope on average, and he wanted to lightly disc it the soybean ground in the fall. <laughs> His soil loss um, is just too high. So. Getting back to what Mike was saying, culture of conservation. There's no reason somebody should do this, especially when with a no-till or strip-till system or a contour system, he can reduce his soil loss by half. Culture of conservation means we have to get to a point where this is no longer socially acceptable. Right? Am I wrong about that? You guys see these fields all the time. I see stuff all the time. Probably that my clients don't see. You know, we get we have the luxury of you know being ag professionals and probably the single greatest place to grow corn on the face of the earth, right? We're out there. I mean, at least I hope we are all the time driving around, looking at fields, what's on the edge of a field, what soil loss look like. <clears throat> you guys have different eyes for this than what your clients grow. So make it a priority. Measure it and fix it. So, soil loss, any questions on that? It's a big, big thing because, um, you know, we talk about resource concerns like, like soil loss, nutrient loss. A lot of times, the things we do to fix one are going to fix the other. So pay attention to them. Um, so, conservation basics, um, resource concerns, nutrient management. Um, I forgot how many of you guys said 
<laughs> you're selling fertilizer. Um, but have you ever used the Iowa State's maximum return to nitrogen calculator? Does anybody use that? When they when, sit down with your clients, look at what the optimum end rate is. <clears throat> Here's how I'm gonna guess that conversation goes if you do it, because I've done the same thing. I'm not pointing fingers. Um, years back we did some nutrient management plans in, I can't remember what watershed it was, over by Little Wall Lake. So I was meeting with a farmer, looking at the nitrogen rate um, calculator, and explaining it to him. It's an economic model. It calculates, you know, based on the ratio of nit or the ratio of nitrogen price to corn price, how much nitrogen is actually going to pay for more, for more bushels, and at what point <coughs> you don't get any return from that. So we sit down and we look at this calculator, and I'm explaining it to him, saying, so this is based on, you know, all these years of of plot research, you know. Um, and it's telling us this is what your optimum rate is. So we look at the optimum rate. So 145 pounds. Are you good with that? And so we kind of look at each other and we're like, okay, we'll do 160 then, right? <laughs> How often does that happen? Applying fertilizer, nitrogen, as a form of cheap insurance or to mitigate risk. There's a lot of logic to that, you know. There is some logic at least to it, I'll put it that way. It's an easy trap to fall into. But when you're telling people how much, you know, P and K to put on, and for now, let's worry more about phosphorus and nitrogen. We can't apply the luxury rates, the insurance rates, the little bit more just to be sure rates anymore. You know? If we don't do that, it's, it's another example of a thing, but if we don't fix that voluntarily, that's when there's going to be a regulatory process to fix it for you. Um, and it's you know it's money it's it's money in their pocket. Um, <clears throat> we did some work with the Peter Kaviriga Soybean Association doing collecting nitrogen rate surveys and stock nitrate tests for two years in a row um, and looking at this whole along the bottom each of those is an individual field. Um, looking at total nitrogen rates, crop yield, we got, it was actually pretty cool, we got uh, yield maps from most of these guys. But look at the, that line in the middle, that's the Iowa State MRTN rate, right? How many people in that whole watershed were below that? <laughs> none, none. <clears throat> so think about this as you know, that's how much nitrogen we're wasting. That right there, that difference, is me sitting down with that guy and saying, okay, if our optimum rate's 145, let's do 165 just to be sure. How often does that happen? It happens all the time. I fall into that trap. Anybody who advises farmers on the ground and stuff, it's an easy thing to do. Um, so, anyway, we're not going to do it anymore. It's no longer socially acceptable, right? Anyway, by cutting his net savings <coughs> rates, um, his net savings would be five to seven bucks an acre. That doesn't sound like a lot. <clears throat> How many of your clients have a lot of money to throw around this year? Um, it's tight out there. I've seen, you know, talking to seed dealers and some of them, some folks like that. It's hard for people to get financing. Um, have one long-time client who is going to, frankly, pretty struggle to farm next year just because of selling an estate issue. And there's no fat to trim in an operation anymore. Estate issues, sales, control of the state to become a big deal. Even a good farmer is going to put them over the edge. So five to seven, eight, so five to seven dollars doesn't sound like a lot, um, but every five to seven dollars is going to help in this environment. Now, if you look at how that affects the nutrient reduction strategy from the baseline to go from this 187 pounds down to say 150 even. Five to 10% reduction in nitrate loading. Five to 10%. So, anybody recall what the nutrient reduction strategy goals are? From non-point sources, 41%. So, last 10 minutes been well spent. We've just got 10% of the way there, so. 
We just got to go out and do it. But back to measuring things. What do we track? If yield is all we care about, we won't solve the problem. Track overall nitrogen rates. Get a sense for what you're recommending, how much people are applying, who's over applying, who's frankly wasting money. Get a sense of nitrogen usage. <laughs> this figure down there. I mean, if you all remember, when I was a teenager, I remember it used to be 1.2 pounds of N per bushel, right? You, see, you hear a lot of people bragging about how they're 0 0.8, 0 0.6, whatever. We talk about yield, but do we talk about that as a ranking factor or a benchmarking factor for our clients? That's an easy calculation to do. Um, but if we don't do it, it's just like soil loss. We won't have any context for comparing or understanding the difference between different farm operations and our performance over time as CCAs. Phosphorus rates is another good one, okay? Nutrient management. Um, so, what do you guys think the average soil test phosphorus values are in your region? Show of hands. Is the average phosphorus test an optimum for clients you work with? Is it 20 to 30 parts per million with the malic tree? Is it 30 plus? 40 plus? We should not need to be applying fertilizer if it's over 21 parts per million. How many of you do that? I do it. <laughs> and I'm going to show you how we, we make these variable rate maps, algorithms, all this stuff. It's like nitrogen. It is an easy trap to fall into. Just a little bit more just to be sure, because we don't want it to be low, God forbid. So these are some charts from Antonio Malarino. Um, basically, that's the, where that $4 is written. That's the environment where we are right now. <clears throat> At $4 corn, you know, when I survey prices in the fall and then this spring, we're at 47 to 51 cents a unit for P205. If you look at this on the far right, how many of those are we getting responses, yield responses from phosphorus? Very few. Very few. And we've already just established that our phosphorus levels are too high anyway. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well. But it, this kind of goes back to that return on investment or net returns and the nutrient reduction strategy. So you see there a map on the left where we did some grid sampling. There in the center, it's a old, um, oh, there's like a cattle hoop barn. So a lot of that field has had manure for, at least in parts of it, you know, <clears throat> for many years, but the distribution is not that good, which is typical. I mean, if you look at a lot of soil test results, that's the norm. Um, all this is, that's $6 an acre net return just to eliminate applying phosphorus where it's very high and above, or even high and above. Now, my point being that I do it too is that if you look at that map closely, and I, I realize these aren't very good um, scans, we're still applying a uh, a half rate or a minimum rate where phosphorus test levels are 30 to 40 parts per million. Yeah, we're saving $6. Yes, the sampling, yes, variable rate is a no-brainer. People aren't doing it, they should be. So why did I tell this guy, let's just put a floor on those rates and let's not apply, let's not apply zero rates unless it's above 40 parts per million. We all do it, right? But we need to tighten it up. Otherwise, we're not going to solve that problem. I mean, it's wasted money. If they have to apply phosphorus, put on starters or something like that. If you want to apply 5 to 10 pounds of 1034 or something, fine. But we don't need to apply the applying dry fertilizer in these areas. <coughs> Back to um, average test values. Um, this is something that um, my lab put together for me. <coughs> All of Iowa, um, Northeast Iowa, and then my 
they separated out my group just because I was curious. Look at those test values. 40 parts per million is normal. Now, when we do sampling, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, it's, it varies a little bit by, by region, but we do a lot of sampling in, say, some of the seed corn growing regions. It is super common to see people have 40 and 50 parts per million phosphorus tests. There's no reason to do that. Going back to that, that other page on the variable rate maps, $6 an acre in net return, 17% reduction in phosphorus loading. So, any questions on that? But again, it's something, ask your lab for that information. When I emailed um, Jim Fredericks, I think is his name, they, they keep stats on all this stuff. Midwest Labs is great at doing that. I mean, it's nothing for me to ask them, give me some summaries of my stuff compared to the rest of the state, give me Northeast Iowa, whatever. Ask for that stuff. Get some context for where some of your clients are. If their average test levels for phosphorus are 50 parts per million and above, what's the issue? I mean, is it too much manure? Not a place to put that manure? I mean, that, that happens, I get it. <coughs> Um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it or can't. So, um, what time is it? Am I going to run over, Mike? Or because Craig wants to talk also. Um, we'll kind of yeah. twenty minutes, so fifteen minutes or so. The break. Okay. Okay. Um, so, nutrients in surface and groundwater. Some of that gets back to our. Um, applying nutrients excessively or too much or more than we should. Um, some of it gets to just the fact that we are a heavily child drained state. We lose nitrates in our tidal water. We lose nitrates on the edge of field where we have a lot of runoff and it goes into a ditch or something. But my point on this, if you have open tidal outlet, you see something like this in a field. For the sake of your clients, don't let them be, don't let them let that be the face of agriculture in Iowa. There's no reason that should happen. And in fact, if they've got a tile out to a ditch or a creek, there's no reason that they shouldn't have a bioreactor or something like that. Here's a nice picture of a bioreactor going in. Um, Keegan, I think, is going to talk about some of this stuff later, and he's much more experienced and well-versed in installing edge field treatment practices, but this is an example, a bioreactor, where if you've got a tile outlet into a ditch or a creek, this is pretty inexpensive to put in. Um, the state would love to have all of you, have five guys call your local soil and water conservation district to have one of these put in. They're literally trying to give away money to get people to treat tile water. <clears throat> but they don't know everybody that you know. So tell your clients to do some of that stuff. <clears throat> saturated buffers is a treatment system. Anybody, everybody familiar with saturated buffers? Basically, it's a, where you run a lateral and a saturated zone along a creek so that instead of tile routing directly to a creek, it filters through that saturated zone. Bioreactors, saturated buffers, weapons, other edge of field stuff. People don't have to change anything about their management to install something like this. It's sitting there on the edge of the field. It's helping solve nutrient production issues. And they can still go, you know, they shouldn't, but they can still go disc the soybean ground in the fall, whatever. Um, wetlands. <coughs> wetlands are bigger. Um, they're attractive, in my mind, because they treat a, a large area. So we're talking small subwater units, <coughs> 200 to 500 acres. Um, and the nitrate load reduction is massive. If we were gonna, if we, if we were gonna solve the nutrient reduction strategy whole issue <coughs> in the simplest way and not change anything that we do, it would be by adding a bunch of small wetlands across the countryside. 
Um, competitive rates on permanent or long-term easements. Um, I think a client of mine recently, it was like, I want to say $9,000 an acre for either a 30-year or a, a permanent easement. Um, for a 19-acre wetland that treats probably 400 acres, 300, 400. Um, and businesses right now that are strapped for cash flow, to do something like this that's sustainable, that we hope, we don't know, might pay off in other ways down the road, that's pretty attractive right now. How many of your clients are just buying new trucks, throwing money around, buying farms, whatever? There's some pain out there. All of these appeal practices. Again, talk to the NRCS, find out your soil loss. Ask somebody about this. Do I have a site on my farm that will work for one of these? Do my clients have a site on their farms? Go to IDAL's website. They have a bunch of great resources and pictures on edge field practices. Find out what the siting requirements are. Keegan will talk about that. Think about all the farm ground you see. Um, the state is literally trying to give these away. In fact, I think they are giving them away. Am I wrong? <laughs> Be an early adopter. There's no reason that we shouldn't do this. I mean, I've challenged myself to do that better this year. Like I said, I mean, we get kind of divided between the conservation planning and outreach stuff and the agronomy stuff. <clears throat> uh, the agronomy stuff, which is what you guys do with your clients, <clears throat> probably mostly, I'm guessing. We don't always ask them about conservation. We don't always think about it. Is it acceptable for me to say, well, this guy, we just talked about corn. We don't talk about anything else. It's not. I can't do that anymore. We can't do that anymore as a profession. Cover crops are probably the hottest, one of the hotter topics right now. There's so many programs to get cover crops. Um, part of the reason they're <clears throat> important is because they treat nutrient losses in, in uh, surface and groundwater, and they treat soil erosion, so phosphorus losses. Um, I wrote the, some payment rates down below there. Um, how many of you guys, like say, uh, how many of you guys have recommended somebody plant cover crops? Some farms definitely need it. Um, how good a job are we doing in telling our farmers what money is out there? I can almost guarantee you, if you wanted to plant cover crops, if you had a farmer, client, who wanted to plant cover crops next year, you can find a program to, look, to get them to be able to do it. Um, so, that would be my challenge too. Um, get somebody to sign up some new ground for cover crop next year. <coughs> So a summary, if we look at soil erosion, help your customers preserve their greatest asset. Reduce tillage. Nobody needs to work ground that's going to soybeans. There's literally no yield difference. <clears throat> Nutrient management. Measure and improve what we're doing. Keep track of nitrogen, nitrogen use efficiency and stop applying insurance rates of fertilizer. It's easy to do. It's an easy trap to fall into. Um, and then the non-point source stuff. If you have tile drain fields, and we all do, what are we doing about that? Because it's no longer socially acceptable for us to just say, well, yeah, it goes into the creek or the river. It's not my problem. Somebody else's problem somewhere downstream. Um, so, I think I just made all your plants like 20 bucks an acre. So let me tell you how. Nitrogen rate, net return, five bucks an acre. It's not a lot, but it's something. Variable rate phosphorus with zero rates that are reasonable. Take 30 parts per million and above. Don't apply any. Net $6 an acre. Those are five and 10%, 17% um, respectively, nutrient reduction. Sign up for cover crops. Your payment rates are going to range from $15 to $35 an acre. 
14 to 24 in variable cost, depending on how you do it. Um, it's probably a net gain. Um, I know the NRCS's payment rates are structured to be to cover half of the expected cost of doing that. I think the, the cost of doing cover crops has come down um, as we see more seed production locally, so there's probably <coughs> a little margin in it. That's okay. That makes it easy to get your clients to do it. <laughs> They're going to appreciate you making them money. Um, so for 2019, I just had a couple things that occurred to me. Plant winter, okay, so we've already established that there may be some decent margin in cover crop, or that at least it covers our costs, whatever the cost share is. Think of all the corn acres you have. There is no reason that we shouldn't plant winter rye on all of our corn acres, kill it in spring and plant, right? If we did that on all the corn acres in the state of Iowa, we're literally three-fourths of the way there to solving the nutrient reduction problem. It's a all-of-the-above strategy. We need to do everything. We need to do the edge of field practices, treat tile water. But if there's one thing anybody could do that literally will pay for itself, plant winter cover, winter hardy grasses following corn. Whatever excess nitrates out there, suck it up, you know. Um, no till your soybeans. Just those two things. Those are money makers. Those are net gains in your pocket, in your client's pocket. Um, the other things I challenge you to do is apply for EQIP or WQI cost share. Um, have your clients go to their local NRCS office. Talk to the Soil and Water Conservation Minister. If there's a watershed project in your area, sign them up. Um, CAP 132, I think the NRCS is going to be speaking in one of the next two sessions, but it's a soil resources management plan. It's a pilot project this year. Um, I think it started last year, but they didn't have a real strong rollout because I think how they wanted to do it or what they were doing is, was still kind of being decided. That's a pilot project for Iowa this year. When we talk about measuring soil loss, soil erosion, subfield level profitability, that's what a TSP will do for, for your clients if they sign up for this. I think it pays like, you know, whatever the payment rate is, it's gonna cover the cost of the TSP. I don't think there's a margin in it, but it might help improve their operation. So I think the payment rate is probably $1,600 or something like that. And then use a nitrification inhibitor on any qualified end. Uh, not that we had any last year anyway. <laughs> um, and then edge of field practice assessments. Look it up. Have your clients look it up. Um, call Keegan. Ask somebody to come out. Say, hey, would this work? <clears throat> Any questions? That's my daughter. Is she cute? <laughs> she was learning to, this was about a year ago, she was learning to roll her eyes. So, <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, I work, I, I'm down in the southwest corner of the state, and like you had some average uh, uh, phosphorus numbers, uh, P1 numbers, like 41 across the state is what you had up there? Yeah, yeah. And where's that data? Is that out of Ames, out of Iowa State? Where that That's from my lab. So oh, I, use, I don't know if you, y'all probably have heard of AgSource, I mean one of the bigger labs. So AgSource Midwest, um, Minnesota Valley does a lot in Iowa. So I think any of those labs will aggregate that information. For you, if you're a customer. Well, down down where we're at, we maybe have higher product. You know, we average maybe in the high 20s, yeah. mid 20s on the ones in, in our part of the state, and we're still a lot less aggressive than some of your numbers are as far as what we apply and what we don't apply. Uh, we're pretty adamant about not putting two years worth of fertilizer on. Yeah, I think that's uh, cool. that you didn't mention that would be a very good would be a lot of help. I think it's yeah, loading up and. Uh, every other year, and so we we recommend uh, taking care of each crop annually. Yeah. Um, so there's I don't know just a lot of things that, that you know work. So uh, we're already doing maybe. Right, and that's yeah, um, and that's good. Um, so like, what do you think is the average CSR two then for sixty 
I mean, I will say that um, I do see production differences where, I mean, I think sometimes if it's lower productivity, <coughs> people might not fertilize to excess because it's not profitable. I'd say one of the areas where I've seen a lot of <coughs> super high phosphorus tests is in seed corn ground. A lot of that goes on high quality ground. A lot of times they're fertilizing for a 200 bushel corn crop and they're only pulling off 70 bushels of seed corn. So there are, you see just regionally different systemic things like that. Um, but yeah, some of that seed corn ground is where I would say we sometimes see test levels 50, averages 45 to 50 parts per million. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I think we have time for one or two more. Other than, then I'll go ahead. Oh, I was just going to throw in one more plug with the cover crop cost here. You know, we always promote that crop insurance premium reduction. Yeah. And then you don't have to mess with, uh, you don't want to go into an office or apply for cost. It's only five bucks an acre, but if you just want to mess around and just starting out, you know, there's no yeah. cap on it, but it's something that some people prefer because they can just do it online and self-certify and you don't have to mess with it beyond that. So yeah, it's a little bit easier way to get started. Uh, there's just another one more option that yeah. folks can use, and it's just a we're <coughs> projecting it's a premium reduction on your on your crop, crop insurance. insurance. And make sure your clients know about that stuff. I mean, there are literally so many programs of, available for cover crop, like through Stein Seed has one. I think that they started this past year. I mean, I can't keep track of them all, but but there are a number of them out there. So with that, I'm gonna unless there's another question, I'll turn it over to Greg. Why